We're going to uh, get down to the Word of God, and uh, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians and chapter 5. Those of you who are regular worshippers here or follow us on the web will know that I have been doing a series, Walking with God, Walking with God. And uh, we started out by saying that if you walk with God, you're going to walk in love because God is love. It means that when we walk with God, we walk in His love, knowing that He desires to fellowship with us, knowing that He loves us, knowing that He has fully accepted us. Jesus has paid the price whereby we can be in a loving heart relationship with the Father. The Holy Spirit has caused the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts and we walk in His love knowing that we are eternally loved and valued and accepted in Christ. Also, that reflects in our lives. So as we walk with God, we ourselves begin to become, or to pick up the family likeness and, 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 and walk in love ourselves and begin to show and demonstrate love. We've been spending time on that. You can get those either online, or all these messages are stored online for you to pick up, or you can get your copy from the front desk. Now I want to speak about another aspect, and that's walking in light. Walking in light. God is love, and if you walk with God, you're walking in love, God is light. So if you're walking with God, you are walking in light. And that's where we pick up our reading from Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Walking in light. Now, the two statements I was uh, mentioning in my preamble, God is love and God is light, come from John's writings, his epistles. And uh, it's interesting to have a look at what Paul means when he talks about walking in light. And uh, Paul is very clear on this. He has one consistent theme. When he talks about light, he's talking about revelation. He's talking about truth. I believe he builds on Old Testament understanding. For example, Psalm 119 verse 105. It says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word, in other words, lights up your path. You don't have to walk in darkness. Uh, you can avoid all of the stumbling places. And you can see where you are going. And uh, when it's dark, you, you can't see where you're going. And that's why it's important to have good lighting. And uh, our civil, uh, uh, civic uh, authorities make sure that the street lights are working and everything like that. And you don't want to be somewhere where it's dark and you don't know where you're going. It happened to me once. Um, I have a friend who is totally blind. And um, when walking around with him in the daytime, he will rely on you. He'll just take hold of your arm just gently and you walk and you guide him through. It's no big deal. But once we're out walking together at a Christian camp, and once we're out walking together and uh, just wandered away from the camp for a bit, went down and, and to a place in the countryside, there was no street lighting. It was very overcast, very, very dark. I couldn't see anything in front of me at all. But I kept on walking, and he said, just, just be careful because there's a ditch just down there to your right. I said, how do you know that? He said, well, it's, just, it's a ditch, it's there. And I checked it out. Yes, there was a ditch. 
I said, how did you know that? He said, well, you know, when you don't have your sight, you just got to pick up signals from other things. He could just sort of tell. And that was a great lesson to me. And uh, what it reminds me of is this, that we have a light on the inside of us that shows us whatever the external circumstances are, we know where to put our feet. Because God's word will lighten up our path every single step of the, of the way. Also, it reminds me of Psalm 119, verses 100, verse 103, 130. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. See, God's word gives us light. It gives us revelation. It gives us understanding. And these are the kind of thoughts that Paul has when he talks about us walking in light. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul speaks about the glorious light of the gospel. Uh, and the glory of the gospel is Christ. The gospel of Christ. And he describes the, the state of mind of unbelievers who have not yet accepted Christ, and he talks about their understanding being darkened. And so he says this, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, The unbelieving whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And so Paul is speaking about revelation. Revelation concerning Jesus Christ. He is the light. And as we walk in the light of the gospel, we're walking in relationship with the one who is the light. We are walking in light and we're walking in fellowship with that light. And it's all to do with the revelation of who Jesus is and what he calls us to do in our lives. That's why the Apostle Paul says in, back in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, the passage that I, that I read earlier, he says, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. It's amazing, isn't it? It's so Christ-centered. It's not a philosophy. It's not a dogma. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It, 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 it is a person whose name is Jesus. And if you are walking with Jesus, you are walking in light. And you are never lacking in understanding because Jesus is revealing himself to you. Himself, who he is, what he's done for you, who you are in him, what your capacity is in him, and what he calls you to do. Interesting to me that, that Paul, even in Paul's day, there were sleepy dead Christians. Interesting, isn't it? Though the early church is bound to be full of fire, full of life, but Paul says, come on people, wake up! Some of you are dead, dead Christian. It shouldn't be, a, it's an oxymoron. You know, you know what I mean by that? I'm talking about, you know, like those two words like are contradictory. A Christian has life, but a dead Christian, it's possible to be a Christian and be dead. I've met plenty of people like that, have you? I just wonder sometimes if they're still breathing. Some of them are so dumb, you know, why are you, are you alive? There was a, a woman in, in, in a church that I used to be at many, many years ago when I was a student. And uh, she could sleep with her eyes open. <laughs> she could. And the proof was at every Sunday evening gospel service. She sat there fast asleep with her eyes open. And you say, well, how do you know she was asleep? Well, she was snoring. So this is what some Christians are like. They go through life with their eyes open, but inside fast asleep. Dead Christians. And Paul says, wake up! Christ is going to give you light. You know, if you need to sleep, sometimes when traveled in different time zones and you arrive in a place where it's the middle of the night for you, but in the middle of the day for them, you know, you've got to go and close those curtains and shut the light out because something happens when the light goes out. A chemical is released which helps you sleep. And that's why you close the curtains to try and go to sleep. You can't try hard to sleep with the light on. Or conversely, in the morning, when you have to get, get up for, you know, the 11 o'clock service, I know you know nothing about the 9 o'clock service, but there is a 9 o'clock service. But I don't want to talk to you about that. I don't want to upset you. But the 11 o'clock service, you... 
and, you, and what do you do? You get it, you open the curtains, and when the curtains open, the sun shines in and you wake up. And that's the same picture here. Let the light of Jesus shine into your soul today and wake you out of spiritual sleep to say, I'm going to be alive and active for Jesus. And so I want to spend some time today talking to you about what it means to walk in light. The first thing is, as I've already anticipated, and that is that uh, we walk in the light of the glory of God. That's the first thing. Walking in light means walking in the glory of God. And that really tells us the verse I've just been speaking about. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. Christ will give you light. It is Christ's own light, the light of his glory, the light of his presence. And we should be so excited about this because we Pentecostals, Pentecostals, excuse me, we love the glory of God. You can hear people, oh, glory, glory. Everybody loves the glory of God. Glory speaks of the Shekinah presence of God. Glory speaks of the anointing. Glory speaks of the glory of Jesus Christ. And if we love glory, we will love to walk in the light because to walk in the light of his presence is to walk in the light of his glory. So... Especially because before we were saved, we fell so far short of the glory of God. Doesn't Romans 3 verse 23 say, All sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that means every single one of us. Before we came to the light, we were walking in darkness. We were falling short of the glory of God. The glory was removed from us. We could not approach God's glory. And what is interesting about this verse is the different tense. Did you notice it? For all sinned, finished, done. That's one act. We have all sinned as one act. That's what it says. And then it goes on to say, and continue to fall short of God's glory. In other words, that's what we do. So what's that one act? The one act is speaking about the act of the sin of Adam. The Bible says, in Adam all sinned. What that means is, is that Adam is our head. He is the originator of the human race. And when he fell, we all fell with him. Like father, like sons. And, and, and what happened to Adam and Eve when, when they sinned? The Bible says that they became aware that they were naked and they felt ashamed. Very interesting. How is it that their sin would cause them to be aware of their nakedness and to feel ashamed? Oh, well, they were naked before. They weren't wearing any clothes before, but they didn't feel naked and didn't feel ashamed. Well, the truth is, they were clothed in the glory of God. They were so resplendent, so reflecting the glory of God that they weren't ashamed of their own nakedness because they were covered. But when they sinned, that glory was stripped away from their soul and all that was left was nakedness and shame. But praise God. God has dealt with our spiritual nakedness and shame. And now we are clothed with the glory of God. Robed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So where it says all sinned, it means that we have come to be born into the fallen human race and we are born with this sinful nature and darkened understanding. But God says, I have revealed the light of my truth and you can enter into the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. And more than that, as we behold him in all his glory, as we walk in the light of his glory, we are being transformed one of my favorite verses second corinthians 3 verse 18 but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the lord are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord 
So when we walk in the glory of God and walk in the presence of Jesus and walk in the light, it is transforming. All we have to do is focus on Jesus, behold his glory, worship him, adore him, recognize who he is and who we are in him. And the Holy Spirit takes over and begins to change us and shape us. And we are changed from glory to glory. Amen and amen. So walking in the light, number one, is walking in the glory of God. Number two, it means walking in in the truth of who you are. Amen. When we look at Christ, we see who we are in him. Because our lives are hidden in Christ, in God. So when we see the glory of Jesus, we recognize that that glory has been given to us. When we think about how Jesus is loved by the Father, we recognize that we also are beloved of the Father in the Son. I mean, it's so wonderful. We are favored because Jesus is favored. As he is before the Father, so are we in the world. And so when we walk in the light, we discover who we are because the revelation of God touches us. Amen and amen. And Paul talks about this in verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians 5. He says, this is what you were. For once, once you were darkness, but now... You are light in the Lord. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. It's, it's amazing. Now look at the difference because, you know, you know this if, you, if you're mad at somebody. And I know this has never, ever happened to you before. And, and please, don't try this at home. Okay, but if you are mad at somebody, you don't just look at their behavior. You, you look at their identity. So you don't just say to somebody, oh, you're being silly. You say, you're stupid. I mean, you know, like you really label them. And one of the most uh, devastating defensive measures that we employ is by categorizing other people, labeling them, and and generalizing and say, you are stupid, stupid man. What are you doing that for? Stupid, stupid, or whatever. I'm just not going to go beyond the word stupid because this is a sanctified service, but you can fill in the blanks for yourself. But that's what we do. Now, we describe and label them as a person, not just what they're doing. And that's highly insulting, but Paul isn't wanting to insult us. He's telling the truth. He's not insulting us. He said, this is what you were. You were darkness. He doesn't just say you were walking in darkness. He said you were darkness. In other words, this was our nature because we have all sinned in Adam. Uh, The ignorance that's in our heart, the blindness that's in our heart, the hardness that's in our heart, That is our natural condition. This is what we were. And today, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I must tell you in all humility that this describes you until you come to the light. Amen. But there came a time when you and I stepped into the light of Jesus Christ and a change took place. We were taken out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of God's love and the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. We have been delivered from the powers of darkness and our nature has been transformed. We are not what we used to be. Once we were darkness, but now we are light. In the Lord. Amen and amen. And so walking in the truth of who you are is so important. Do you notice how he goes on to say uh, in Ephesians 5 verses 8 and 9. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth. He's saying this. He's saying listen. When you walk in the light. And you allow that light to work through you. You will behave as a child of God. And as a child of light. It's about a capacity that's taking place within you. I'll say more about that in a little while. So we started out by saying walking in light means walking in the glory of God. Secondly, walking in light means walking in the truth of who you are. Thirdly, it means walking in the, tra- in the truth of of Jesus and his word. Amen. It means walking in the truth of Jesus 
and his word. So when Jesus speaks to us and touches our lives, he shines the light of his word. The word brings light. And we, we can be so confused. You know, in today's world, they're not even asking, what is the truth? They're not even asking that, what is the truth? They're ask, asking, is there such a thing as truth? They're not even sure that such a thing exists. I remember preparing for a, a television interview with one of the sharpest uh, um, it, it, television interviewers, a regular journalist, and, right, and uh, he was very, very tough. And uh, I began to, before we did the interview, to get to know him a little bit and try and break the ice a little bit, find out a bit about him and so on. And uh, talked, about, talked about what we did at Kensington Temple and, you know, talked about, I asked, what did he believe about evangelical Christians? And didn't get on to the pen Pentecostal. I just did the Evangelii baby bit, you know. And I said, what? And he said, oh, I, you know, he said, one thing I cannot stand, I cannot abide. I hate certainty. I said, what did you say? I hate certainty. So I said, are you absolutely certain about that? <laughs> I said, do you, do you realize that you're, you're just tripping off the tongue with classical, relative, relativistic philosophy and... Which he changed the subject rather rather quickly, but people today are not even asking what is the truth. They don't even know where the truth exists because they're walking in darkness. But when God shines His light, when the light of the Word touches your life, you are not left in confusion. The Word of God sheds light on how you can live your life. How you live your marriage, how you live your home life, how you live your family life, how you conduct yourself in relationships, how you behave at work, how you earn your living, how you live every part of your life is illuminated by the Word of God. And many people say, yes, you just kissed your brains goodbye. You reduce all moral questions to simplistic right and wrong, black and white issues. How wrong that is is God does not let us off the hook when it comes to walking in the light because there are so many complex issues that are facing us every day of our lives that we are driven to the word of God to search out the will of God to seek the face of God and to use every ounce of our intelligence as well as accepting the truth of God's word it's complex. It's not easy. We need Jesus personally to guide us through many, many moral dilemmas and perplexing questions and problems of life and living. But we do this in the light. We don't do it in the darkness. When I was studying philosophy for my degree, the philosophy lecturer said this one day, I think he was in a, a bit frustrated with all the, all the philosophers that were, we were having to study and the complexities and sometimes the stupidity of, of some of it. And, and, and he said, you know what? Philosophy is nothing more than a blind man in a dark room looking for something that he doesn't even know exists. Another way, you know, it's a bit of a cynical thing, actually. We, human understanding can take us quite a, quite a way to realizing who God is because God's glory and God's beauty and majesty is revealed in creation. And even though our minds are fallen and human reason is fallible, nevertheless, God has left himself a witness and we can find traces of him in our thinking and in our wonder, in our art, in our science, in our medicine, and also in our philosophy, if we have a hungry heart for God, there are signposts that will bring us to the point of the light where we can then simply surrender to who Jesus Christ is. So when it says that Jesus wants us to walk in the light, what's it talking about? We find it in Ephesians 5 verse 10. So he says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. 
I think the NIV says, finding out what pleases the Lord. What does it say there? Find out what pleases the Lord. Find out what is pleasing to Him. Find out what is acceptable to Him. It's very important. Let me explain it to you. The word acceptable or pleasing here means fully agreeable. What is fully agreeable, what Jesus wants, what, what is t- what's going to please him. Don't be in ignorance. Walk in the light and find out what Jesus wants you to do. Amen. And that's the guiding principle in everything. And we can't just guess what he wants to do. We have to ask him. Search his word and let him show us. And in every single situation, there is a way of honoring God. I don't know what situation you're in today. I guess in an audience like this and out there on the internet, there are people who have been through some ty- something like the worst week of your life. That's always possible that there are people like that. Others may have just been through the best week of your life. But at your best or at your worst, the light of God will never let you down. Never let you down. There is a way through. There is guidance in the darkest place. You might be going through the darkest of your circumstance. You might be in the deepest valley right now. You might be walking, as it were, through the valley of the shadow of a death-like experience. But the light of Christ will reach you right where you are. And Jesus has a word for you. There is a way through. There's a revelation for your situation. There's a word from heaven that will bring light to your understanding. And you know what? If you can understand something, you can deal with it. You can't deal with it. You don't understand it. And we don't need to walk about in confusion. And we don't get on the phone to our, our friends and neighbors who are walking in darkness. And some, sometimes some wise words come out of some funny looking people. I mean, I think of, of, of Balaam was rebuked by his own donkey. God can make a donkey speak. So just because somebody doesn't believe what you believe, they can, God can still speak to you through them. And uh, God has his own donkeys. And maybe the God is going to get a kick tomorrow morning from a donkey. And you'll say, I'm not going to listen to you because you are not born again. Well, I may not be born again, but I've got a whole lot more wisdom than you right now. And you call yourself born again. God can speak through donkeys. God can take a straight stick, a, a crooked stick rather, and draw a straight line. So don't despise it. Recognize the voice of God wherever it comes to you. And how do you know that it's the voice of, voice of God? The word of Jesus Christ. The entrance of your word brings light. And where there's light... There's life also. So there's a way through. And and what is this all about? It's about pleasing Him. Oh, so wonderful. Just a simple sentence like that. Find out what pleases God, what pleases the Lord. It tells you everything you need to know about life in Christ. What pleases the Lord. In other words, the Holy Spirit is with you. He is going to show you. You don't have to be foolish or ignorant or lacking in understanding. The answer is there. Seek God in His Word. Seek God in the Spirit. Seek God in prayer. Come before the Lord and He will show you what pleases Him. And you know, this word fully agreeable is very interesting. Because it tells us where we begin from. I don't know if you recall Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or consistent act of worship and service. Present your bodies as acceptable. It's the same word. It means already in the presence of God, we are fully pleasing to Him. Amen. So it's not like we have to find out what pleases Him in order to get on on the good side of Him, get in His good books. You are already in His good books. He has removed all your sin and God has placed you in Christ and you are robed in the glory of Christ. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ and you are as acceptable to God as Jesus is acceptable to God. You can truly go to the Gospels and hear the voice of the Father speaking over the Son. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And you can say, that describes me as well. Because I'm in Christ. 
I'm in Christ as he is before the Father. So are we in the world. So we've already won. We are already ex acceptable to Christ. We don't have to prove ourselves in his presence. Just receive his grace, acknowledge that we are acceptable to him and then walk like it, look like it, live like it. And hidden here is this idea of our motivation. Our motivation to serve God. Our motivation to serve God is the loving gratitude that we have in our heart. Not that, oh, he's done so much for me. Now I better do something for him. It's like when your neighbor invites you in for a meal, you think, oh my goodness, now I've got to have them in my house at some stage. It's not like that. Grace gift is free. There are no strings attached. There are no conditions before, during or after. The only condition is that of faith by which you say, yeah, I receive this free gift. He's not going to twist your arm and say, look what I've done for you. After all I've done for you, that's how you can treat me. That's manipulation. You've, you've had friends like that, I'm sure. Sometimes the friends like that, who needs enemies? But I mean, you've got friends like that who say, how can you treat me like this after all I've done for you? In other words, everything I've done for you is in order that you would do the same for me. That's not God. God says, I love you anyway. My grace gift to you is free and unconditional. I didn't consult you before I gave you this gift. And I'll not insult you to pay, ask you to pay for it after you have received it. You are acceptable to God. And in this upfront, God-given, total, irrevocable acceptance, which has nothing to do with your behavior or your righteousness, but everything to do with what Jesus has done for you and his righteousness, in the strength of that, you come before him and say, Oh, you so love me. You've done so much for me. I love you so much. What can I, how can I show my love for you? And he says, this is how. Find out what pleases me. And do it because that is his best reward and what blesses him more than anything else. So grace is about becoming who you are. Becoming who you are. It's not about trying to be what you're not. I've seen this. I've seen this for people who have just about to or think about accepting Christ. And I've seen this at work in people who have already accepted Christ. Let me help both of you today. If you're here today and you've not accepted Christ, one of the questions that you might be having is, suppose I do this. Suppose I surrender my life to Jesus. How could I ever keep this up? A lot of people say that. How could I ever keep this up? I've had no desire to read the Bible. And, and I've watched some of you. You attend church services. You're active in cells. And, and this is, we, we know how you live. And I just don't know that I could live like that. I don't know I'm that kind of a person. Well, of course you're not. That's the whole point. None of us were. We were darkness. But now we are light in the Lord. And what that means, a change has taken place. And now we don't like what we used to like. And now we love what we didn't usually love. God has changed us. So the Christian life is not about trying to keep up some kind of standard of living. It is about having a changed heart and letting the fruit of that shine forth in your life. And I might help some people today too who are saying, you know, there's stuff in my life that I love and I don't want to give it up. And I, Christians are telling me, and my brothers and sisters are telling me that this is wrong. And, I, you know, but this is what I want. And for me, being a Christian is trying to be what I am not. Oh, please come to the light of the revelation. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul in his prayer. I keep praying that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him and that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened and opened that you may know the hope of your calling. Wow. Discover who you are. Let God show you who you are. And when you know who you are, you can begin to behave accordingly. And the Holy Spirit will remind you. The illustration I'm about to use is entirely, I accept no responsibility for it. I give you a, a health warning about it. I know nothing about this at all. I'm just using my imagination. 
But I am now imagining what might have happened in the royal household uh, as Prince Charles was growing up. So you can see I'll have, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, about this. I'm just imagining. So you imagine with me? Is it a deal? Okay, so I can imagine Charles growing up. And I wonder when he first realized that he was going to be king, that he was prince and going to be king, next in line to the throne. I wonder, was it at the age of two? Okay, Charles, remember, you're going to be king. What's that, mummy? You're going to take my place. But mummy, you're a queen. How do I know how? Oh, I don't know how it went. I don't know how it went. But there must have been a moment when Charles began to understand that he was the heir to the throne. I wonder how that made him think. I wonder if it made him think about how he should behave. What was going to be expected of him. And I can also imagine somebody saying, Charles, that's no way for a future king to behave. Remember that? All right? That's no way to behave. So he discovered who he was and then learned to live appropriately. And I mean, I must, must just say, I think it is current popular opinion, and I'm kind of in line with it, that the royal family has just been absolutely amazingly received in this Queen's uh, 60th Jubilee year. And, and, and I think that so many people are saying how, how well that's happening. And if that's the truth, then a lot of it's to do with prayers, God's people praying for the royal family, for, the, for stability and, and so on. Okay, getting back to you and me. We are heirs to the throne. Did you know that? Amen. Amen. I want to tell you, you just thought I was Pastor Colin. Some call me Reverend Colin. Some just call me Col. But I'll deal with you later. But really, you should call me Prince Colin. And you should call yourselves prince and princesses. Why didn't you introduce yourself properly now to the person next to you? I'm going to watch this body language. Amen. Princess and princesses. Your royal highnesses. You are next in line to the throne. Indeed, you are already seated with Christ on the throne of the universe. Hallelujah. Do you know what? I feel better right now. I feel lighter. I even feel thinner right now. I feel great. Do you feel great? You are heirs to the throne. You are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. That's who you are. So now, the next comes the discipline of the Holy Spirit who is walking with you, preparing you to take your place in Christ on the throne of God. And he will say, ah, ah, remember, you're a prince, you're a princess, that's no way to behave. You, and this is how the Holy Spirit works. He is so clear. He's so clear. He's not sentimental. He won't sit down and say, Oh, this is the will of Jesus, but I understand how hard it is for you. I understand your point of view. Do you know what? You break my heart. You bring tears to my eyes. I'm going to change the whole rule book just because of you. It's okay, you can keep on living like that because God understands and I feel so humble. He does not like that. He'll just say, hey, Apana. Una fanya nini. Nita pige we we. No, I didn't. Should I say that in English? No, I can't. Not that I don't know what it means, but some things work. That's why I go into different languages. Some things work. Only in my mother tongue. So he says, no, watch it. I'm going to keep you in line. I'm going to bring you in line. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And when you're walking in light, go ahead, give him praise.
When you're walking in light, you're walking in the Holy Spirit. You're keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. You're walking with the Holy Spirit. You are yoked to Christ. And His yoke is easy as long as you stay next to Him. You try and pull away and it sure begins to hurt your neck. Try it. No, 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 don't try it. No, no, don't try it. Trust me. Trust me. It's like that. So you become who you are. You become in your behavior who you are in Christ. You learn to live out your position and capacity in Christ. I mean, this is, this is amazing. You know, there is an image I can use for this. Uh, you know that we're looking at, uh, at uh, solar energy. It's one of the big things. Solar energy. It'll never work in Britain, but anyway. Solar, for obvious reasons. Solar energy. And that is where they convert the light from the sun to electrical energy. And for that, you need a photoelectric cell. Where David Wellington is not feeling very well today, so he's not here to, to pick me up on my science. But is that what it is? A photoelectrical cell. Is that something that it'll do? You don't. Okay. Anyway, the, you need something that changes light into electricity. But when the light comes, the power. When the light comes, the power is released. The power is generated. You have, on the inside of you, a massive spiritual photoelectrical cell. And when the light of God's revelation strikes you in your spirit, energy is generated. Power is released. And you can do what God calls you to do. You, when the revelation comes, you can do what you didn't think you could ever do. Somebody said, oh, please pray for me. I'm at the end of my tether. So I pray and God says, tell them they don't know how long their tether is. <laughs> you know, so often our feelings tell us we can't. But the Bible says I can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me power and strength generated photoelectrically in a spiritual sense by the rays of the revelation of the Son of God. Amen and amen. amen. So number four, walking in fellowship with others. Walking in fellowship with others. When we walk in the light, we walk in the light together. That old song, you know that old song? Sunday school song. I was going to sing, but I just caught myself just in time. I just, just managed to prevent myself from doing it. So I'll give, Jesus bids me shine with a pure, clear light, etc. How does it go from there? I'll have to sing it. Jesus bids me shine with a pure, clear light, like a little candle shining in the night. In this world of darkness, so who we must shine. You in your small corner, and I in mine. What a lie. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how we could teach our kids that nonsense. You in your small corner, in this world of darkness. There's a picture of one little kid in one corner. Oh, mommy, mommy, it's so dark. Never mind, honey. You got a little candle, but I can't see you. No, no problem. Just shut up and stay there. And, and Johnny and the other side, me too, me too. No, it's not like that. We're not in our little corners with a little flickering candle. We are in Christ, who is the Son of Light. We're in Christ. When the light comes on, it's not a little candle. It's more like a lighthouse. It's more like the floodgates, the floodlights of the Olympic Stadium being switched on. We can see everything because we are shining together. And these commandments like shine and, 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 and reprove the works of darkness, they're not written in the singular like to you as an individual and to me as an individual only. It's written to us together. We're in this together. We join together. We shine together. And we shine so much more brightly together than we do on our own. This isn't about an individualistic little faith where we are stuck somewhere far away from fellowship and revelation and truth and God's people. No, we sur surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit through one another.
Amen and amen. That's why it says in Hebrews 3 verse 13, Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. When I was away in one of those North African nations that I visited recently, and this is an, an underground church where, I don't mean literally underground, you know, I'm talking about an underground church, uh, and they rely on each other, and they know they need each other, and one man in every little meeting was, went before he left the place, every single person, how are you? I want to encourage you. Hold firm to Jesus. Deal with anything in your life. Let me pray for you. He did this to everybody all the time, and I said, what are you doing? He said, the Bible says that we're to encourage one another. The Bible says we're to confront one another, help one another, encourage one another. That's what this is all about. Praise God. How wonderful. How wonderful. And we are doing this through the cells. And one of the favorite verses in our cell groups is Proverbs 18 verse 24. What does it say? A man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Wow. That's what friendship in the cells is all about. There is a friend. Your cell friends. Your cellmates. Not prison cell. <laughs> Although that could be arranged. They're there to stand with you. And this friendship is developing. It's wonderful to see people sticking together and in groups and learning how to relate to one another. But remember, please don't forget, there is another verse. And the other verse is this, Proverbs 27 verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Your friends aren't around you just to make you feel good and tell you you are right. And even when they know you are wrong and you know you are wrong, just say, it doesn't matter. I'm your friend. I'm not going to challenge you. A real friend will speak the truth in love. A real friend will, will aff afflict a wound if necessary. I mean, you know, have this th the thing your best friend, only your best friend will tell you. Your breath smells or change your D.O. B.O. or something, I don't know. But if somebody is really a friend, if you want to be really a friend for somebody, confront them with the power of the light. Out of love. You are not a friend if you just keep perpetuating them in their current pattern of behavior. You stick closely. All this talk about light and fire alarm. This is just, hold it right there. We'll just see if this is, a, hold it right there. We'll just see. You will have health and safety and security Tell me if this is a false alarm or not. Otherwise, we'll have to leave this building in an orderly place. I know the devil switches on that fire alarm every time the anointing begins to flow. Amen. So if you are a friend for somebody, make sure you stick to them closer like a brother. You support them. You're loyal to them. You help them. You encourage them. But you also challenge them. And correct them out of love. We're in this together. And they're just coming to the final, final. Number five, shining as a witness. Verse 11, Ephesians 5. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. Whoever makes manifest is light. We're all clear? We're all clear. Stay where you are. Thank you very much. This is what it's about. We shine our lights. We're not part of the darkness. We're not part of the problem. We're part of the solution. It doesn't mean to say that we, we're perfect. And with some darkness inside, we said, God, help me. Open up your heart. Let his light shine. The light of his word, the light of his truth, the light of his love. Let it flow. But let it show. Don't just let it flow. Let it show. Let it show. I want to finish with this. My time is up. Philippians 2, verses 14 to 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. What is that? He says, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Let your light shine. Walk in the light. Walk with the light. Fellowship in the light. Fellowship with the light. Let that light shine into your spirit today and let it lift you up into the truth and revelation of who you are in Christ and what you are capable of doing to glorify God. And as you walk in the glory of God, you know that that glory will reflect from your life to the others around you, sometimes in ways that are surprising that you didn't even realize but you are glowing, you are shining with the glory of God and God will allow them to see that. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the light of your truth and the light of your revelation. We thank you for knowing who you are and knowing who we are in you. We thank you for our position and our possessions as well as our capabilities in the Spirit. You have enabled us to walk in the light. Let us grow in the knowledge and revelation of Christ and let us always know what it is to be children of light. Katika jina la Yesu. Amen and amen. God bless you people of God.